Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 121st episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include host Sarah Gaines, has the new season of The Chase, which airs Sundays on ABC, plus streaming on ABC and Hulu. We'll also visit with Boxing Hall of Famer Ray Boom Boom Mancini. He's executive producer and actor in a new movie, 645, that is available now. We'll also share our monthly visit with grill master Meathead Goldwyn, sharing some August grilling ideas. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and share with your friends. Now, after the last year and a half inside, I feel like all of America has relevant experience for this job. NASA is looking to hire four people willing to pretend to live on Mars for a full year. They posted the job on Friday, and they're accepting applications until September 17th. But they're not just taking anyone. The ideal candidate would be 30 to 55 and have a master's degree in a STEM field like engineering or math. But they'll also accept applications from people with bachelor's degree and some relevant experience. Now, the four people who get chosen will live in a 1,700 square foot enclosed space with no windows for a year. They'll only eat astronaut food and have limited contact with friends and family online. Now, it's not clear how much it pays, but you can head to NASA's website if you'd like to apply. Love the show, The Chase, Sundays, 9 Eastern, 8 local time on ABC, also streaming on ABC and Hulu. And from that, we've got the host, Sarah Haynes, with us today. And first off, Sarah, always great to visit with you, my friend. Thank you so much, Cameron, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Now, tell us, The Chase, are are you surprised about the ongoing popularity and how juice do you get as you get ready for, uh, for new episodes? So first of all, I'm actually not surprised because this format has been very successful globally. It's kind of like the Jeopardy in, um, in England and in Australia because the, the, the format has been tested and tried and continually works. So to get here, you only, uh, here in the U S our version, you just hope you can hold up that torch because it is, um, it is just a, it's just such a fun, quick, fast paced, um, you know, it, it feels like a sprint of knowledge. And um, I feel like the getting ready for the show is a lot of cramming to make sure I'm ready for what's coming down the pipe and answers and questions and pronunciations. And the last thing you want to do is get in the way of these extraordinary contestants and these genius chasers because you flub up a word. So uh, a lot of pressure, but um, I'm, I feel like I usually feel like a fan of the show rather than the host because I get so involved in it. (laughs) That is good. Now you talk about the chasers and you know, you're talking about Ken, James, Brad, and, and how hard are, are they as hard to deal with as we would in our minds expect them to be, or are they quite gracious if you will? Okay. They are the best part. There's also Mark Labette who's visiting this season. He's the beast. He's from, the original version. So he's literally the OG of chasers. Um, the four of them are so awesome. Every time someone asked, I was intimidated to meet them because I had seen them on Jeopardy and knew they were brilliantly smart. And they are some of the coolest guys. They can simultaneously talk crap to each other while never making you feel dumb for not understanding the joke. <laughs> um, and they kind of take you along for the ride. So they have been they're fun. It like to go out. We've, we've had multiple opportunities to have a drink or a meal together and the back and forth. I forget how long they've known each other. It's been a long time, but they kind of feel like brothers. Like they, they loop you right in and allow you to kind of joust with them. I, I, they're some of the best part of being at the show. And as the seasons roll on, obviously we have a little changes. Uh, what, what are some of the new things that folks can expect from the chase? Well, they've kind of, the, the, the chase is at its best when people gamble, when they take big, big offers, big money. This time around on this season, they've changed the way people can get money to incentivize those, that risk taking. Um, the episode coming up this Sunday is actually one of the best ones we shot. Uh, I felt like I had run a bit of a marathon at a sprint pace 
when we were done because there's a lot of unexpected twists in this next week's episode. Um, and this, uh, the intensity of this kind of epitomizes why everyone tunes in. And having been a part of it, I remember coming off the set and I was like, I think we're going to need a longer break in between shooting. I'm exhausted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because when they hold on and, and people make it and they, by just the skin of their teeth, like it is, um, it's a workout. Like it, it's such an exciting game. And this was one of the best ones we shot and it's coming up this Sunday. You talk about taking an extra break between shootings. How long is the typical recording for an episode? I mean, we at home think, oh, it's a 30 minute uh, episode, 30 minute show. Uh, obviously, it's not that way, though, right, Sarah? No, it takes about, so there, you always have to account for, there's so many lawyers involved because game shows and money, right. they handle very carefully and precisely. So if something happens, like, uh, two contestants buzz in or there's going to be a moment where we have to stop down and then the lawyers have to rewatch the tape to make sure that the timing, everything is about fairness because there's so much money. And again, like you'll see the uh, standards people approach the thing and I'm like, Oh, this is going to be a 30 minute. Stop <laughs> so usually every time uh, we shoot, it takes about, I would say roughly about two hours to shoot one episode because they also, as you can imagine, there are questions that when there's nothing happening or, you know, you're going back and forth on the board with the chaser and the contestant one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes you want to make sure you highlight the more exciting moments when they're moving and sometimes when they're both missing a question or they, they edit. They, like, it, it keeps the game true to what it's supposed to be. But because you want to make sure the game is also kind of you're getting the best parts of it, they... They shorten it. You can't shorten a lot though. Cause like the cash build or the time se segments, you can't cut anything out. So it's, um, and if there are technical problems, that's the biggest thing. Right. If, if, uh, that's why I never want to mispronounce or stop down because I can't put anyone at a disadvantage. <laughs> so if something <laughs> happens and I'll, I'll be honest, it rarely does because I am so intense about not messing the game up, but when it does, or if it does, Everyone ascends to the stage and they have to keep everyone separate because no questions can be, I mean, it's so carefully handled, keep it all above the, above the belt. Like they are really great about it. That's right. And again, uh, new episodes of the chase Sunday night, nine Eastern eight local time on ABC also streaming on ABC and Hulu and Sarah always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can keep up with everything you've got going social media wise as well. Oh, thank you, Cameron. You can always tune in uh, for The View on ABC Live at 11. I think that's the same in every market. We don't know. But my <laughs> my uh, social media is all just my name. So Sarah Haynes on Twitter, Sarah Haynes on Instagram. Um, I try to keep it interesting there as well. You get lots of kids, though, because I have little kids, and I became that mom. So get ready for cute kid pictures. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing wrong with that. And Sarah... Always great to visit with you. <laughs> Looking forward to the new episodes, my friend. Thank you so much, Cameron. Now, is it possible that you work with a psychopath? Well, according to this, there's a pretty good chance you do, and an even better chance that I do. A new study found that 4.5% of the general population are psychopaths. That's one in 22 people. And one of the top jobs for psychos is a radio host. Yeah, that's what I do in my regular time. It's number three on the list after CEO and lawyer. Now, the top 10 jobs with the most psychopaths are CEO, lawyer, TV or radio personality, salesperson, surgeon, journalist, priest, police officer, chef, and politician. Now, the 10 jobs with the lowest rate of psychopaths are social workers, nurses, therapists, artisans or craftsmen, stylists, charity workers, teachers, artists, physicians, and accountants. Like I mentioned to him before we came on the air, I, he'll be boom boom to me forever. We've got Ray Boom Boom Mancini on with us talking about the new film 645. And first off, Ray, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Ray, how did you go from boxing into movie making? I mean, was there an, was that an easy transition or was it something that uh, maybe just kind of popped up to you one day? 
No, 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 no. It was not an easy transition. But no, I've been in there. I, I was being represented by the William Morris Agency from 1983 on in my career for, I guess, mainly for commercial endorsements and, and activities like that. And I do commentary. or And, I was, and, and through the years, I was uh, being offered uh, acting roles, cameos in television and film and uh, as myself or, or playing a character. But I was never, never able to take advantage of it because I was in training camp all the time. So when I retired in 1985, I told my agent, "I want to, I want to, I want to try this. I want to do the acting." And he said, "Hey, you got to be where the action is. You got to be out here." So I moved to California in June of '85, and I did the, you know, I started doing the tour uh, auditioning process, and I missed, I, I got some, missed on most, but you know, I was having a great time with it. And then by 1987, 1988, I realized I wanted this is the career I want to choose. I mean, I realized the camera don't punch back. <laughs> First thing that happens is pay two. That ain't bad. So I um I told my agent I wanted to do this, but I started studying and I and I started studying because they want to know that you're uh, they want to know that you're taking it serious. You know, they, I was always going to go in every audition I was going in for. I was oh you're the, so you're the fighter that's acting. Yeah yeah yeah. And finally, after studying with Howard Fine, who was the Angel Dundee of tra- uh, of acting coaches, mm-hmm. um, I was you know I would go out. And I get roles, and then finally, when after I did Opera Way Stage, when I did Opera Way Stage, it was the closest to acting with the, the immediate response, immediate you know feeling because it was the live audience. Uh, it was the closest to fighting that I, I felt. I go on the auditions after that, and every time I say, "Oh, you're the fighter," I say, "No, no, no, no. I'm the actor who fought. <laughs> I'm the actor who won the fight." You got to change the perception because out there they, they they can't think that far ahead. You know, these people have a perception. That's it. And then I realized early on that nobody was taking a shot on me. I had to take a shot on myself. So I started my production company in 1987, Boom Boom Productions. And since then, I've started Champion Pictures, which is a secondary company. And um, I had to create content for myself. And and that's what I did. And I was smart enough to develop relationships with young writers where I'd, you know, pay them for the work. And Mm -hmm. somebody had gone on to, to refer, you know, just to some fame now. And I always remember that. And I was, you know, I've read a lot of scripts. So I, you know, I felt like I knew what a good script was and is, and I, I felt I have a pulse on a, on what, what the audience likes. So I'm a movie goer. So when I read this script, 645, I said, I got to get involved with this. This was a terrific script. It's one of the scripts you read that I read, I read it one sit and it scared the hell out of me. And I called Craig Singer, who I was involved with on another project. And that got pushed back. So he said, can you help out on this one? And so I was able to bring some money to the table and, and you know, some creative ideas. And, um, I mean, that's how I got involved. And the one thing about being a producer, you guarantee yourself a role. That's how I guarantee <laughs> myself a role. So I, uh, I was able to play. It's a small role, but a very important role. And my son, Leonardo, who's an actor, he's done a lot of stage. He's won a war on, war on stage. He's got a three films coming out. Um, for it is important. I, so I got him involved and I said, come on, you know, we'll play a detective team. And, uh, we did. And, and so it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun trying to showcase his, his talents and be part of it. You know, and I'm just, I'm a proud father and, 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 and sit there in the scene. And as long as you don't, don't say, as long as you don't run into the furniture or mess up the scene, you're in good shape. <laughs> there and you I go. Think I did. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, so it's, uh, you know, it's good. But if people like psychological thrillers, which I do, you're gonna love this film. This film is it, it just, it's just it's it's you what you at the end of the film there is no resolve really in your mind. I, I like when I watched it the, when I watched it the first time. Did you did, did I see what I just saw in real time? <laughs> was this guy dreaming that, or was it like something you're thinking of for the future? I mean, you know, it's all that's the great thing about this project. There is no exact resolve for, for all. The, it's up to the individual to come to their own conclusion. We talked last week with Thomas Waits about being involved in the project. And to have an actor like Thomas to be on the project and to have the excitement that he has of being involved in it, I mean, what does that mean to you, Ray, on the executive producer side, if you will? Well, what well, that's exactly what you want. I mean, first of all, <laughs> we put in young, up and coming actors who are on the climb, terrific actors, two leads, Augie Duke and Michael Reed. Not big names, but terrific actors. And then you sprinkle it with names. Thomas G. Waits, what a wonderful actor he is. He's been around forever. 
and of course, Armin Garo from, from The Sopranos and The, the Departed. Mm-hmm. And then for the for the younger crowd, you know, we sprinkle with some of the uh, R&B uh, and rap fans. We have to sprinkle with you know, Remy Ma and 45 King. So, you know, and then they, they also put in a little Italian guy in there to do something. So, uh, you know, it was good. It was good. And uh, uh, it just, it's, you, that's the wonderful thing. When you, you're on set, you see wonderful actors like Thomas G. Wade and Armand Garo work. You know, now you know you're in a real film. It's, right. it's, it's really something. So uh, that's, it's, just, it's the best. It's a great blend because there's not a big budget of film, but it shows what you can do even if you're on a micro budget with the quality, if, if it's quality writing, quality acting, you don't need a big budget to get a quality film. And, and how about Regal coming in? Regal coming in to us, saying, hey, we want to show you a piece and, and show you a film, and we're willing to give you 50, 50 theaters at least. Oh, my God, we get the juggernaut. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, pandemic killed a lot of business. the pandemic killed a lot of businesses. We know that. But two businesses, it actually helped. Was one was a mom-and-pop restaurant that didn't depend on indoor mm-hmm. dining. They killed it with the takeout. They killed it, right? There's restaurants in Mount Youngstown here that killed it. And not only survived, but thrived during the pandemic. And two, independent film. Because we can hit the ground running. For the studios, we must rev up. Independent film, <laughs> you can practice in four weeks and start shooting. Boom. As long as you get the money in place, you get the business side in place, you can hit the ground running quickly. And that's what we were able to do. And uh, we shot, and how about this? We had shut in January, February of 2020, right before the pandemic. How, how <laughs> apropos that this is a film about, this is a film about, you know, a time loop. Because everyone lived that a couple months later. We were living the time loop. You know, <laughs> the, wake up, the same thing was happening day after day. It was like I was reliving the film. That is right. And again, the film 645, it is available now. And Ray, I always want to make sure and let folks know not only where to find more about the movie, but everything you've got going social-wise as well, sir. Well, you can check me out. I'm, I'm on Instagram and Instagram and uh, Twitter. And one, one of my biggest is that my Instagram is, uh, is at, at Real Boom Boom, real, as opposed to the fake one, right? Real Boom Boom. <laughs> and I think my Twitter is real, real Boom Boom Mancini. Or it's vice versa. One of them's Real Boom Boom Mancini, one of them a real, real Boom Boom. And then um, I, I have a, a website, but we're actually rebut, we're, we're reworking now to, to add the new stuff and, and to contemporize it. So that should be out another month or so. And then um, uh, Facebook, yeah, Facebook is just I'm at Ray Mancini. So uh, anyhow, but the Twitter and Instagram seem the things that people catch on the most. So. Yeah, that's people to see me on social media. That is right. Well, Ray, Boom Boom Mancini, truly an honor and privilege to visit with her. I Thanks. hope you have a great rest of your week, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again, sir. Thank you. I will look forward to it. If you observe Lent, one of the main points is sacrificing something for 40 days and avoiding the temptation, like abstaining from alcohol or Big Macs. But a Russian woman couldn't make it through, and now she's suing McDonald's because their burger ads were too tempting. She's an Orthodox Christian, and she says that in April of 2019, she'd made it most of the way through Lent. But then she saw a McDonald's ad and, quote, couldn't help herself. She says she immediately went to McDonald's and got a cheeseburger. Now, the woman is claiming it's a, quote, violation of the consumer protection law and she wants the court to investigate. She wants McDonald's to compensate her for moral damage in the amount of 1,000 rubles, which broken down is about $14 US. It is time for our monthly visit with our good friend, the grill man extraordinaire, the uh, the grand poobah of grilling, uh, Meathead Goldwyn, and Meathead, always good to see him, my friend. Always good to see see you too. Wasn't the Grand Poobah something out of Gilbert and Sullivan? Should, should we play walk on music from yeah. Gilbert and Sullivan when I come on? You know, like they do on baseball games, walk on music. We we may have to do that. 
Now, it's hard to believe, but uh, we're already into August, Meathead. And, uh, you know, we cover every every month we cover different grilling ideas. And I know that it's around harvest time and uh, there's a lot of veggies out there. And we're going to talk some about that today. What is your favorite coming in? I, I know one of my favorites is corn, but I've never been one that's real good on the grill with corn. Well, Corn, well, veggies, and 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 fruits. Um, right, right. Um, uh, peaches are coming in now, and uh, oh my goodness, uh, uh, <laughs> we get peaches out of Michigan, and they are just incredible, better than Georgia and Carolina peaches, I think. But uh, corn is, you know, it's a little bit of summer heaven. Uh, August is a great month if you're uh, if, if you're a food lover, um, uh, you know, with tomatoes and eggplants and corn and zucchini. Uh, but I just absolutely adore corn. There are times when we'll just have three or four years of corn, and that's dinner. Um, and they, and what's interesting about corn now is there are new hybrids. Um, they crossbreed these, uh, and they come up with uh, new hybrids. And, you know, the old saying used to be is um, you get the water boiling before you go out into the field and pick the corn because the minute you pick the corn, the sugars start right. degrading. The enzymes change it to starches. Um, and you want to get it in the boiling pot immediately to kill the uh, enzymes. But uh, some of these new hybrids, uh, there's a variety called Mirai that uh, uh, comes out of southern Illinois and uh, uh, sugar sweet and maple sweet. And uh, they have, um, they last longer. Uh, they stay sweet for days. And boy, I love them. Um, when I start talking about grilling corn, though, it's highly controversial. It's amazing. I always get hate mail when I tell people how to how I do it because they have their way of doing it, and it's always the right way. And uh, of course, but there are there are different ways. I mean, some people like to throw it on the grill, husk on, or, or they might first soak it in ice water and then throw the wet husk on the grill. And what you get then is you get steamed corn. Um, which is delightful. Um, and steamed corn, whether you steam it on the grill or you steam it in the house or you boil it in the house is very tender. Um, but if you remove the husk and grill it over the flame, the kernels will turn golden and brown and that's the sugar caramelizing and you get complex, deeper flavors. Now the kernels are just a little chewier um, than when you steam them or you cook them in the husk. So you have to make that trade-off. Do you want this extra flavor level and extra sweetness um, in exchange for tenderness? I go for the sweetness. I got a sweet tooth. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, if you've got really good sweet, fresh corn, I don't need to put butter on it at the table or salt it at the table. I'll just eat it naked. I mean, the corn is naked, not me. Um <laughs> But um, uh, sometimes, uh, and this is a fun treatment, and, 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 and some of your listeners might want to try this. I'll take some butter and some olive oil and put it in a little saucepan and go out and pick some tarragon. My wife grows tarragon in the garden. She's got a lovely herb garden. Having an herb garden is not hard, and, boy, it really can amp up your food. And um, uh, just a little tarragon, chop it up, throw it in that oil and butter, not much. And then I'll paint the corn with this while it's on the grill. Um, most of it drips off, but it leaves behind a, a delicate, mild tarragon flavor. Mm. And I just love that. Tarragon goes really well with corn and eggs. Um, and uh, that, that's a really nice treatment. So I strip the husks off. I'm a husk off guy. I know there's a lot of husk on people out there. And you guys... Right camera, not yeah. me. <laughs> I knew you were going to throw me under the bus. I knew where we were going with that. <laughs> but I do have this concept and technique on the website on AmazingRibs.com if you want to read precisely how I go about it. And another one of those summer vegetables, or fr we're going to get in an argument here, fruit or a vegetable, the tomatoes. There's it uh, is a fruit, yes. <laughs> there's so many different variations of those uh, that can be done in different ways on the grill, too. And I like the, uh, the those cherry tomatoes on the grill. I love the uh, recipe you have on those. Yeah, I, what if you have a smoker, um, you can do something really cool with it. If not, you can do it on the grill too. But the idea is, is, you know, cherry tomatoes are very sweet. They're like grapes. 
um, and uh, or grape tomatoes, actually, right. either one. They're very, very sweet. Um, I'll bring them in, and you know, you just put one plant in the ground, and you're swimming in cherry tomatoes. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, when they're ripe, we haul them in the house, and I'll just take a sharp tip knife and poke a couple of holes in each one so that uh, uh, moisture can come out. And then you roll them around on the grill on the indirect side. Now, we've talked about this before, but in case you haven't heard me, I want always, almost always when you're grilling, you want to divide your grill in two halves. A lot of heat on one side and no heat on the other side. You got, in, you got direct infrared radiation on the hot side, and you have cool convection airflow on the not hot side. It's also a safe zone, and there's a million reasons why. And we won't get into that again because I've talked about it a hundred times with you. <laughs> but this is a good opportunity. You put the cherry tomatoes on the indirect side, not over flame, and they'll roast warm. And you can throw wood on the fire on the hot side, and they'll smoke. Or if you have a smoker, just toss them on the smoker at your lowest possible temperature, and they begin to dehydrate. And it can take three, four hours at 200 degrees or so for them to shrink, maybe even more. And they get down to like raisins. And in fact, they look like raisins. They feel like raisins. You don't want to dry them out. This is like sun-dried tomatoes. Mm -hmm. You know how sweet sun-dried tomatoes are. Well, these are oven dried tomatoes or smoker dried tomatoes, but the layer of flavor that smoke adds to them is just totally awesome. And um, these things, you can throw them on a salad, you can bake them into a bread or on a top of a focaccia on pizza. There's a, any place you might put a raisin, you can put these things or any place you would put sun dried tomatoes, you can put these things and they are fantastic. They just have a really pop, a powerful pop, um, and uh, a great use of cherry tomatoes, and uh, uh, they freeze. You can throw them in the freezer and keep them all winter long and have a taste of summer uh, during the winter. Well, you, you talked about the, the zone cooking. I actually had to break that rule for a, a little bit yesterday because I came to the end of my propane tank. So I had to move everything. <laughs> the, the flames went out, had to move all my burgers over to what was the hot zone at one point. So, yeah, I did have to break it slightly. Yeah, well, you know, the meathead method is have two, have a backup. You got to have two <laughs> tanks on hand so that, when, you know, it's like backing up your uh, computer. You got to have this because it always happens. You know, it runs out right in the middle of those you know, $20 steaks, you know, and the boss is waiting in the dining room and you're out of uh, propane. Um, but uh, no, that's a, that's a good technique. You know, we we're talking about tomatoes though. There's um, uh, other fun things you can do. I I've noticed that the grocery stores now, you, you could buy canned tomatoes always mm -hmm. in the grocery store. I see now more and more that tomato companies are sell selling fire roasted tomatoes and they're more expensive. But you can do this yourself, especially with the uh, the egg shaped tomatoes, the Romas. They're they're not right. as juicy as the beefsteaks or the Better Boys. Um, uh, they're they're more meaty. Um, but you just slice them in half. You've got to make sure that the grill grates are really clean, really clean. You've got to really wipe them down, scrub them down, throw a little water on there get a, a paper towel and your brush and brush them. You don't want any meat grease on your tomatoes. Um, and then um, put these over the direct heat side and just stand there and watch them. You can sprinkle a little salt on if you wish until they get a little char, maybe some grill marks, flip them over, get the other side, the skin side. Um, and then when you bring them in, after they cool for a little bit, you ought to be able to pop the skins right off. And then you can chop these babies up. And if you know how to do sterile canning, you can just can them or use them on a pizza. Uh, anywhere you might use um, chopped tomatoes, uh, tomato salad. Uh, and it, it, again, it concentrates the flavor by dehydrating them. And you get that grill flavor, which is just marvelous. And you save a few bucks, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, Nothing wrong with that. Talk about fruits. And it seems like every time we talk about grilled fruits, I always bring up my favorite pineapple. So, so we're going to, that's, that's the only uh, mention we'll do of the pineapple. Once, once a month, I talked to a, <laughs> a, a barbecue podcast and I made the awful mistake once of telling him my favorite thing on the grill is pineapple, which of course from meathead just, you know, and the guy won't leave me alone about it, but it is, I mean, there is just nothing better than pineapple on the grill. 
but um, peaches on the grill are right up there with it. And it's peach season right now. Um, uh, a lot of states have peaches, but I think the best ones come from the northern cooler climates. And this is a commonality in most fruits. Um, and, and wine lovers will tell you this. The best wines come from cool climates. What happens is you get a warm, hot day, which builds the sugar in the fruit, and then it cools off at night. And because it's cool, it retains the acidity. So you get this really great sugar acid balance in the grapes and the peaches. And South Carolina and Georgia both brag about their peaches. But I got to tell you, the peaches I'm getting now out of Michigan or Washington State, they're fantastic. And they've got a better sugar acid balance. Now, if you want to grill peaches, you want to try to get what they call freestone peaches. And those are the ones where the stone or the pit comes off pretty easy. You can just cut the peach in half and twist and they'll pop right off the stone. The, um, uh, the cling peaches actually cling to the stone and you can cook those too, but there, they leave, there's just a lot of peach yeah. stuck on that, which you can just suck off. But, uh, um, and you can, again, you've got to real make sure that grill is really clean and you put the cut side down and uh, get some grill marks on there. Get a little bit of char, um, get them soft. And uh, my wife came up with a recipe a while back where she uh, took some rum and some sugar and mixed them together with a little butter and made a rum sauce um, with a scoop of vanilla ice cream out of this world. I've got this recipe. You can find it right on the homepage of AmazingRibs.com. And uh, it, it's just, I, in fact, just before we went on the air, I went out to remind her, I said, and, and if you're going shopping anytime soon, pick up vanilla ice cream because I want to <laughs> have these babies. Um, we, we're, we're getting um, uh, Red Haven, Michigan peaches in now, and they're, they're, they're eat over the sink peaches. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and Meathead, you're, you're not pulling any punches. You're, you're picking on uh, the, the corn cookers. You're picking on the southern bound uh, peach growers. Uh, you're just not making... You're you're, you're not working on making friends today, are you? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I already made it into the Hall of Fame. I don't have to kiss up to anybody. <laughs> you know, but that's always something that we have developed a reputation for is myth busting. And there's so many myths surrounding food and especially barbecue. And, you know, arguing about barbecue, especially in a bar, it often leads to gunplay. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so it's just fun though. But I mean, I just love cooking and uh, I love eating as much as I love cooking and barbecue is anything you can cook indoors. You can cook outdoors only better. That's right. And you talked about uh, breaking the myths, uh, the book meathead, the science uh, of grilling. That's uh, tell our listeners again, uh, where they can find more information about, about the book and then got seasonings coming up soon and all kinds of other stuff as well. Uh, the book should be in most bookstores, but if it's not, it is on Amazon. Um, it lists for 35 bucks, but I've seen it discounted for as little as 21 bucks on Amazon. And uh, uh, it's selling well, um, uh, up to about a quarter million copies. It's called Meathead, The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-part book. The first part is all about the science of grilling. It's all about what is smoke, what is fire, what is heat, what is what different kinds of energy on the grill. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the old idea of teach the concept. And once you learn these concepts, then you can grill anything. That's right. And uh, upcoming, uh, what, what else you got coming up uh, as we close out on 2021? Uh, well, God, we're not closing out. I hope we're not closing out. <laughs> we're getting close. We're crying out loud. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, in, the, we're, in, the, we're in, the, in the heart of it. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're working on getting some rubs and sauces on the market. They're not there yet. I'm trying to get another book done, but that won't be out for a year or two. The book publishing process is painful. <laughs> um, we're finishing the touches on an ebook on Turkey. Uh, hopefully we'll be on the, um, on Amazon. It'll be a Kindle book. Uh, uh, before Thanksgiving, everything you needed to know about turkey. Turkey on the grill is a lot of fun. And uh, uh, just uh, right now, you know, I'm I'm veghead, not meathead. Uh, my wife is a master gardener, and uh, uh, we uh, we eat from the garden. 
That's right. Well, Meathead, it is always a, a privilege to have the chance to visit with you each month. I appreciate you taking some time out. And, of course, uh, for any questions, AmazingRibs.com. Of course, you can follow them on all the socials as well. And I'll see you next month. Thanks again for joining us for this 121st episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, anything else you'd like to know, just hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, tumblers, mugs, stickers, and more. GQwithcam.com forward slash shop. Of course, if you do have a special guest idea, you can send me an email at gqwithcam at gmail.com. Well, thanks again to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday. <laughs>